There we go. Oh, good. Welcome. Um, it's so good to um, be speaking this morning. Um, heart goes out to Jimmy, Elma, and the family. Jimmy has bailed us out so many times. It was impossible not to offer to step in. Um, so last night, I sat down about 8.30 once the kids were asleep and laid my Bible out and my iPad out and closed my eyes to hear from God. And then I woke up at 2 a.m. in the morning with nothing prepared. <laughs> So it was a sleepless night and a five o'clock start this morning. But that's me exposing myself as a Christian. I should have had a sermon up my sleeve, shouldn't I? True leader would have a sermon up his sleeve and I never, so. Um, I thought, what, what do you speak on? And I always remember a sermon that I listened to and it said, use what's in your hand. I always remember that from a Bible story of a, a guy who overcame a battle with what was in his hand. So I thought, great, I'll start with my testimony. And I'll share a little bit of my journey. But now I see the kids are in, I'm going to shortcut my testimony by about 10 crucial minutes. It might not be um, too suitable for young ears. Um, but just to um, introduce myself, if you don't know me, I'm Stephen and married to Zara, and I have two girls here, Amelia and Sophia. Um, I've been in the building trade since I left school. I wasn't the most academic at school, and I, was, I think as soon as they could get me out, um, so I've been in the building trade, plumbing and heating, and um, at the age of 25, I got saved. Um, kind of came out of nothing, I suppose most salvations possibly do. Um, it, was a, it was a special night when I look back. Um, I had been uh, living a sort of colourful, um, single guy's life. There's the 10 minutes just been shaved right off, right there. You use your imagination. I wasn't a good boy, and um, and I remember one Sunday evening, just um, kind of like winding down, ready to start work again the next day, and the most bizarre experience took place in my room, where I heard, not audibly, but as it, somebody spoke to me, but not audibly, if I could explain that, it was like, you know when you talk to yourself, it was like somebody talking to me within my thoughts, maybe that's the best way to explain it. And it, the words spoken to me were, you've been away from me for too long now and it's time to come back. And followed by that was an immediate rush of butterflies in my stomach. Um, and within minutes, my mum and dad shouted up and said, there was a, a revival going on in a church in Glasgow, we're gonna to go tonight, do you want to come? And I was just like, I just went up and was, there was an altar call and I always remember the altar call kind of like, leaning forward like this, like I was being pushed, like, who's pushing me? But I realized I was being drawn by the Holy Spirit and I just surrendered my pride in front of my parents um, and I walked up to the front of the church and gave my life to Jesus there and then, not really knowing what I had done in one respect, but at the same time knew that something significant had happened and all that shameful living and, and the past and the, 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 the weight of guilt that I was carrying about had all of a sudden just been lifted and I've been on a, a journey since and uh, finally found my way to the Vine Church and I think uh, yeah like 14 years now maybe and I've not been kicked out yet so probably doing something right if that's the case. Nobody's bombed you off, put you on a remote island somewhere to start a church of one. But um, it's, been, it's been amazing and uh, what I want to do today is, is use my journey as a sort of map so I don't want to stand up here and be like judgmental and you say things that, that, you, that might come across as if they point the finger. Just, I'm only sharing what I've experienced and been through in areas of uh, weakness that I've had to work on. And one of those weaknesses is what you can read up here. It's, it's, it's not being close to God. It's been distant too often for too long a period at each time and, I, and I'm guessing I'm not the only one who's walked through a season where you've felt distant from God. Um, so I'm going to just talk about what's made me distant from God but I want to start by sharing God's heart from the Bible, His Word over us and it's Psalm uh, 139. So I'll read it out and we'll, we'll move on. Um, and look through it. It says, O oh Lord, you have examined my heart and know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. 
You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say before I even say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest ocean, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in the utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand, and when I wake up, you are still with me. How beautiful is God's heart. Amazing. It's pretty clear from reading Psalm 139 that we can't escape God's presence, his goodness, his grace, his love. But I did say in the first couple of verses, you know my thoughts even when I'm far away. So it is possible for us to distance ourselves from God. And like I say, I've been through those seasons too many times for too long a period, and I want to learn how to rein it in a little bit. And I've got a, a, a video to show later, which kind of convicted me a little bit. So, um, so um, just to back up, that it says in Romans 8 as well, 8, 35 to 39, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries for about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the first and obvious, um, how could I, a hurdle or pitfall in becoming distant from God is the most obvious one in faith, and it is it is sin, um, and sin is something that we all uh, face the temptation of daily. It's it's accessible on phones, or we can sin by. Um, our harsh words or unwholesome words towards people or situations are we're so vulnerable to the possibility of sinning but we're even also possible of falling into sin that can become more prolonged and damaging to our walk with God and our faith and sin offends God and it separates us um, from him and um, because God is holy he can't ignore it um, he can't excuse it, and he can't tolerate it either, um, as though it didn't matter. It's a, it's a big deal. It's why the world's in the mess that it's in. Um, sin cuts people off from God. It forms a wall and isolates God from the people he loves. Um, and it does make God angry, and it forces them to look the other way. And often we know we sin, and uh, I, like I say, I'm speaking to my, from my own experiences, 
um, but sometimes we sin maybe with an unscriptural grace in our mind or in our thoughts that it won't matter if I sin because God will forgive me anyway, but that's not how grace works and that's not how we should be um, approaching God's grace. Um, it's, it's, it's an unscriptural one and, um, and I know in my early years of being a Christian that that might have been a thought that it wouldn't matter um, how I lived or what because I would be forgiven anyway. Um, but we know sin uh, is um, it's destructive and we know that it, it puts that gap between us and so some of my walk with God's been a struggle because I've had sin in my life that I've not dealt with and I've struggled to get close and into the presence of God because I haven't dealt or faced up to that and we know the consequences of sin is death and people who die um, and sin will be separated eternally from God and God wants us to live um, with him he wants us to live for him he wants us to live through him he wants to give us the very very best and, and to keep on top uh, um, keep ourselves accountable and keep ourselves um, focused on his words and making sure that we're not abusing um, his grace and, and, and making um, uh, excuses, if you like, to continue to uh, not deal with something in our life. Um, and so a question that we should be asking ourselves is, have I confessed my sin to God? Am I doing that on a daily basis? Am I approaching the, the throne of grace and am I approaching the cross asking for forgiveness? Because we do probably sin more than we would like to admit and it is a stumbling block, has been a stumbling block for me um, but, you know God wants if you, God wants to save each one of us every single human being we had a, a prayer meeting recently over the Ukraine situation and we all prayed for the things that you would expect to pray for like the, the peace and for um, for God to move and for people to be their lives to be spared and for healing in the nation and um, Eddie, I don't know if he's in here, but Eddie prayed specifically for Vladimir Putin and he prayed the most gracious prayer for that man's soul. It humbled me as a Christian because I was thinking the opposite of that time. Like, somebody needs to pull this guy aside and have a word. Eddie prayed this beautiful prayer of grace and that's the Christian heart um, right there that God wants every single human being to spend eternity from him. When we read one, Psalm 139, even uh, our, the worst enemy is included within that because God's created everyone and given them a chance to live for him. And it says in Isaiah 59, 1, 2 that God wants to save us. And it says, listen, the Lord's arm is not too weak to save you, nor is his ear too deaf to hear your call. It's your sins that have cut you off from God. And because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Do you know what? Thank God for Jesus when you read that. Do you not think that our sins had cut us off? We've just celebrated Easter. There's the message of grace. Jesus given his life so that God would turn and listen, that we could go direct. Um, it's amazing what Jesus has done um, for us. Um, do you know, my earlier years of coming to the Vine Church were... I was blown away by the lights and the worship and the warm welcome I used to get from everyone and how people genuinely wanted to know you and get your number and catch up for coffees and stuff. Um, it was the best feeling ever and that went on, it still goes on to this day. Um, but you know, I also left here feeling convicted and challenged by the word that the preacher spoke. It always seemed as if they had been spying on me that week watching me somehow and the word they brought was to cut right through me and I used to leave here feeling so convicted I used to leave here feeling um, so disappointed in myself because I knew I was doing things that I shouldn't be doing and yet somebody preached from a place of grace and delivered God's word for my benefit and I used to leave here feeling on a mission like I am overcoming this battle I'm getting through this I'm going for Jesus I'm leaving the past behind and we're on a journey 
And that's why it's important for us to keep coming and hearing God's word and listening to what's been said and letting it cut. You know, the Bible says it cuts right through us and, and challenges us and convicts us. Um, so I'm grateful for everyone who stood on this platform and preached and poured out and, and, and spoken messages. Sometimes I bet they were really uncomfortable messages to deliver, but they did it being faithful to God, knowing that myself and many others I used to bring some riffraffs with me, so we probably all benefited from that message as well. So uh, I'm so grateful for this church standing by God's word, preaching truth. Um, and I'm still here 14 years later, and that's because we're a Bible-believing church. I mean, we preach what's written in the word, and we follow it through. We're a, we're a, we're a good bunch, aren't we, Divine Church? <laughs> so... Um, Another pitfall, and I would say this one's just as damaging, another pitfall that I have suffered from is religion. Religion's when you move from God's presence and His voice and His spirit, and we become a little bit caught up in our own opinions and thoughts and how we think things should be, and we um, become a little bit hard-hearted and um, the, the presence of God doesn't seem to be able to get through to us because we've shut ourselves off from that very place that God wants us to walk in on a daily basis. And religion is like a thief and it steals the most intimate moments that God wants to spend with us. It gets in the way of the voice of the one who wants to call, the one who calls us to him. Religion will block out the sound of the, the voice of the Holy Spirit. It's from my experiences, from how I have acted, going through periods of when I know I've been um, ha had a bit of a religious spirit. Um, it's like turning up to church and just going through the motions, participating in worship but not engaging, or choosing to even try and get in to it. It's like we're at a concert or something, and you just want them to do all the work, and like, but it, it's 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 not entering that, that presence of God and that um, environment of worship. It softens us up and builds us up and renews us inside. It's sitting through sermons when you're not really interested because the word's blocked out by religious earplugs. And there is no pressure on anyone in here today, by the way, me saying that. Um, it's, so it's turning up to prayer meetings or life groups because I have to or because I should, but not because I'm hungry to be there. I want to be there. I want to meet in the presence of God where two or three are gathered. It's turning up with a can't be bothered attitude, but I'll do it anyway. It's choosing to do um, the right thing, living in the right way, but not because we want to be obedient as such, or because we want to please God, but rather because we can't do the things that we're, we're turning away from. I can't do that because I'm a Christian, but the Christian heart should not want any, to entertain any of that. It should be sold out for Jesus and filled with his spirit. A religious spirit can make us selfish and unwilling to share our faith. We can lose the passion to reach out to the lost, to bless others and to give without limits. I have experienced these things far too many times, too frequently, and that's why I'm sharing that. I'm just trying to help anyone who might be experiencing similar things. I heard that um, religion could be described as like a, a leprosy. Leprosy is an infection um, caused by slow-growing bacteria, and it affects the nerves, the skin, and the eyes, and the lining of the nose. It doesn't sound like a pretty experience. And religion can be described just like that because it, expect, it affects our spiritual nerves. So we can no longer feel the sweet presence of Jesus. We no, don't, aren't aware of that atmosphere of his presence. It desensitizes um, us from God's presence and more, uh, maybe more easily could be described as like you don't ever feel anything or you don't feel this and you don't feel that. You don't get into the worship and you can't get into the word. And often we blame the preacher or the band, but often it can be right in here in our heart that's actually the very core of the problem. Um, it can be, leprosy can be like, a spiritual leprosy can be 
affect our eyes, our spiritual eyes, where we no longer see through the eyes of Jesus and our day-to-day um, going arounds and ordinary people filled with his Holy Spirit, no longer seeing the need of other people around us. Um, um, it can affect, um, we can also become, um, through that, um, develop a critical and cynical attitude towards things. Um, and it's not something to be taken lightly. Our relig- religion is not approved of by God. It, it tells us in James that, that true religion um, separates what true religion is compared to how um, it was lived out. Um, and it can affect our eternal destiny. Um, it's dangerous and can, it's dangerous and it can rob us of that. It says in Matthew 7, 21, 23, that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do what my Father in heaven wants will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we prophesy in your name? Didn't we, didn't we drive out demons in your name? Didn't we do many miracles in your name? Then I'll tell them clearly, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who do evil. Man alive, I've never prophesied, and I've, I can't remember driving out demons. These guys are in a better place than me, and they were at risk of um, this. And so Jesus exposed those people who sounded religious, but they had no personal relationship with him. Um, and on judgment, they are, well, it's only our relationship with Jesus and our acceptance of him as our Savior and our obedience to him that will matter on that on the day. Um, a lot of people think it's based on good deeds, and we know that that's not right, but that's a, a religious mindset that a good deeds will, will spare us and save us, but it's only our faith in Jesus Christ con- um, confessing our sins and asking him for his forgiveness. The last thing I want to speak on is the heart, but I found a video that speaks it so much better than me, um, so I'm going to let him do the work, and it's a really good listen. It's only three minutes long, and after that, uh, we've not got much more to go, so um, if you could just play that video, that'd be awesome. If you're despairing about your prayer life, um, which I have done at times, one quote that I remember from Tozer is, every man is as close to God as he wants to be. And uh, so I always look at myself and go, okay, why am I not praying? It's because I really don't want to pray. And, you know, not to put it on any externals of busyness or whatever. Uh, why am I not sensing this intimacy and connection with God? It's me. It's not him. It's me. And so, Lord, what is it? And I know that if I just fast for a day or two it'll get me back on track Uh, sometimes I'm just too lazy to do that or I'm just craving sushi too much or whatever Um, I know if I would just wake up earlier the next morning and force myself in a different environment where I just know I'll be focused and deeper in the word it'll happen I mean part of me wants to say I'm sorry to hear that and then there's another part of me that wants to exhort you and go it doesn't have to be that way from my experience I I also do pray during those times and say God give me a longing for you and I know that's very unnatural because if I said to my wife I don't really love you that much pray that I would love you more, you know, or help me love you more. It's kind of a weird thing to say to her. But that, that's almost exactly what God wants me to pray to him. Say, Lord, I can't even love you without your help. So stir that in me. And as I'm going to pursue you, as I'm going to pray, like, like the Psalm 27 I, I was talking about, that one thing I'm going to ask, but I'm going to seek after it also. Um, and that's that's just to, to just dwell there in your temple, just to be there in your house. And so, Father, I'm going to pursue it, but I'm asking you, stir up my affections. And I go back to, yeah, I, I, I think Tozer was right. Every man is as close to God as he wants to be. And so I don't want to let you off the hook 
and say, oh, we all go through phases like that. Yeah, we do, but we can all snap out of it too. Wow, that's a great video, wasn't it? So graciously spoken. And the sermon title, I think, is one thing you could take away is um, that every man is as close to God as he wants to be. And I know we go through challenging times um, and with our faith, and we go through seasons of dryness and drought. Um, but I want to pray today and, and, and over anyone who might be in that place and um, get us back on track and on fire and um, filled with God's uh, Holy Spirit. And there's no better place or it, it to be. It says in the, the last bit of Psalm 139 that I never read out, was, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out everything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. God's heart is to walk with us on a daily basis. He's cheering us on. He's encouraging us along the way. He's praying for us. He's um, um, healing us and doing so many wonderful things. He loves each of us so much. And I wonder um, if Lindsay would pray. I haven't asked her. Um, so is that okay that you be all right with that? And um, over us all, and we'll move into worship.